So ladies and gentlemen, to speak about this very issue, someone um, you know, I have personally interacted with on a number of um, economic indicators. We've had a number of conversations about the energy uh, crisis. He currently is also the chairman of the Standing Committee on Water Resources at the Senate of Pakistan. And of course, he'll be talking about the future of healthcare for the country, especially in terms of governance and policy making. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Dr. Musaddiq Malik. Thank you very much. Um, it's impossible to talk about the future of healthcare without talking about the future. And I think I, I'm reminded of uh, Bernard Shaw's little statement where he says, there are those who look at, look at things the way they are and ask why. I look at things that never were and ask why not. And I think it's impossible to talk about the future without asking this question. I, I was not going to use this slide, but a friend of mine reminded me last night. I sometimes use this as a starting point for looking at future. The first time I personally looked at future is when I watched Star Trek. I remember we were little kids, and I believe at that point in time, television was black and white. You may find it hard to believe. And both of us brothers, every single time there was Star Trek, we'll run, we'll just run to the television, and we'd stay glued. It was like magic. It was like we were in a, in a dreamland. And, 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 and mind you, we didn't know English. So we were kind of toddlers, we were maybe six, five, seven, I don't recall. We didn't know English, but the magic in Star Trek was so compelling that we were glued to it. N place where no man would dare space the ultimate frontier, where no man would dare to go. Well, so much for that space. The Star Trek series was still going on when near about everything that we used to see in Star Trek became a reality. There was this little transponder, if you remember, Spock would pull it up and say, beam me, Scotty. That little transponder, it basically became the first generation of cell phones. And when cell phones came in the 1980s, I believe, the, the Star Trek series was still ongoing. And that little thing that we used to have in Star Trek where you would push the button and coffee would come down, that was the segue to, to microwave. And that holodoc, holodeck, which was so bizarre that you were in the space and there's an enormous screen and all of a sudden the enemy appears on the screen and you just press a button and you shout at the enemy and you press the button and the screen goes out. That's Zoom. That's everything. So that's Skype. That's Zoom. And this all began to happen. It's, Everything that Star Trek, Star Trek had is right here on this telephone. This, my friends, is the power of imagination. And there are only two ways of looking at any system or any strategy. One is, as Shaw said, to look at things the way they are and ask why. In strategic sense, it's like looking at healthcare or looking at any arena and saying, what can I do? But there's perhaps another way of looking at things. That is to imagine a future, then take a position in that future and ask a different question. Not what can I do, but what would it take? And that's how science has propelled us to where we are. Because everyone who's looking into the future, who's creating futuristic societies, or futuristic healthcare systems, or futuristic educational system, or futuristic industrial platform has to ask this question. What is the future going to look like? What position am I going to take? What is the ideal healthcare system in that future? 
And what would it take to build that ideal system or what would it take to build that ideal company? And that's basically how innovation is driven. And it's all about innovation. It's all about productivity, it's all about innovation. And one time innovation you can get, like we do, through diffusion of technology. We can go, techno what is technology? Technology is something which happened, that happened about 10 years ago or seven years ago. It takes that long to, for it to commercialize and become available. So by the time you're catching up and you're trying to import that technology, you're already toast. You just don't know that. So the underlying engine, the belly of productivity, the belly of moving into that future that you haven't seen is innovation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where the future is going and I think my predecessor has already spoken about components of it. I'll take your components with your permission and try to weave a future that we can all see coherently and then try to see if we are along that journey of getting into that future of healthcare or not and what may be the hurdles. <clears throat> In order for us to build that future, the first thing that we have to do is look at trends. Trends are not drivers, trends are things that are visible to you. So these are generally short-term things. So what basically are the trends that we see in healthcare? We see the burden of illness increasing. And the burden of illness is increasing because people are living longer. And because people are living longer, they're having diseases of age. All of the things that you are acquainted with or you think about when you're thinking healthcare, cancer, blood pressure, diabetes, even, frankly, this little virus, COVID-19, it is selective. It is selective because it's hitting age. It's killing people who are over 65 years of age, just like cancer, just like diabetes, just like hypertension or coronary artery diseases or syndrome X. Everything is selected and differential. And differential it is to age. So it's about aging. And as we age, and as we are aging, one out of 65, not shall be, are over 65 in civilized, developed Western worlds. They already are. So there's a level of selectivity there. There's a de level of selectivity towards death that basically compounds your age. And that is why the burden of illness is increasing. And because this burden of illness is continuously increasing, the, the, the role of policymakers and the role of payers is also increasing. In Pakistan, we've also launched a healthcare kind of system, the newly kind of launched system. Ask yourself where the financing is going to come from. If every person, 220 million people, are going to have 10 lakh rupees worth of health care, I ask you a very simple question. Where is the financing for 220 million multiplied by 10 lakh? And if you don't find an answer, then you should know that the demand function is going to become very, very sophisticated. And the role of payer and the role of policymaker is going to become critical. So the way you are going about selling your healthcare products, whether they be pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals or vitamins or primary healthcare or secondary healthcare or hospice care, it's not going to be the same way even in Pakistan. This has already happened in the United States, already happened in Europe and Canada. It is now bound to happen with this insurance system kicking in. It is bound to happen in Pakistan. And very soon, you would all be thinking about the cost of healthcare. And there would be pricing pressures, and there would be formularies, and there'd be controls, and there'd be basically utilization control mechanisms, things that we haven't thought about. All we know is get up, go to the doctor, get a script, get it from wherever it is, and now that you may have insurance, you may walk into a hospital and get some care. But that is going to re require a certain infrastructure which is not in place. 
The infrastructure of hospitals is not in place. The inf infrastructure of specialty care is not in place. The infrastructure of primary care is not in place. The infrastructure of prevention is not in place. And what is going to happen? The most cost-effective intervention is prevention. And have you ever heard the word prevention or health promotion in Pakistan? Well, soon you're going to hear. Because 220 million multiplied by 10 lakhs or 220 million divided by a family of five multiplied by 10 lakhs the numbers don't add up and therefore the role of pair and the role of policymaker is going to increase and the world is not going to be very soon either the system would bomb and with the next political change or even within this dispensation the system will collapse because there'd be no financing for it. But if the financing is brought into place, then the system cannot stay the way it is. It is absolutely impossible because the numbers don't add up. So this is going to be a whole new trend that we may or may not be used to. The third thing which is very important, the third trend, short-term trend that we're seeing, is the ubiquitousness of data. As I said, Look at this. This is office, this is home, this is illness, this is disease, this is epidemiology, this is connectivity, this is shopping, this is what? This is far more sophisticated than the holodeck that Star Trek had. So therefore, the clinic, the hospital, is this the hospital or is this the hospital? Is this the clinic or is this the clinic? Is the patch on my shoulder going to monitor my vitals 24-7 and someone else is going to run some algorithms and tell me when I'm going to be predisposed to a stroke or a heart attack? Am I going to be picked up before that or after death? All of these things, all of these gimmickries, this, this blurriness, the ubiquitousness of information, the connectivity, what this is lent to is complete diffusion of demarcation between what the clinic was and what home was and what the office was. So these settings in which healthcare is going to be delivered, these settings are all but blurred. And in this blurriness, you'll have to come up with new settings, new ways of delivering healthcare, new way of thinking about illness and health and de death and, and, and prevention and so on and so forth. So these are the short-term trends that you have to think about. This is here and now. Nothing that I've said so far in the way of trends is for the future. This is all here and now happening. So what is the consequence? The consequence is that the future healthcare, even in Pakistan, definitely elsewhere, but even in Pakistan is going to be number one, patient-centric. Number two, evidence-based. And number three, driven by performance. So all of these people who are used to writing scripts or selling scripts, I tell you, their days are numbered. If we continue to go in the direction in which we are going, they'll have to show performance, they'll have to prove their evidence, they'll have to show real-world evidence, real-world data. They'll have to bring forth evidence to prove that their medication, their intervention, their clinic, their, 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 their specialty, specialization, their laser guns, they work. Otherwise, they would be toast. <clears throat> what is all this driven by? This is driven by four scientific platforms, everything that I've spoken about, and this is where the future is going to take you. There are four big revolutions that are brewing in the world. The first, of course, is nanotechnology, which is the revolution of atoms. And what you used to have were materials which were cut into little devices. Now you're going to have atoms which are going to be configured into devices with zero waste. So this revolution is already brewing. And this revolution is also driven by convergence of technologies. So technologies are going to come together and create what is going to be a device. Very soon you're not going to know 
the retina that has been dropped into your eyes, if that is biology or chemistry or material science or engineering, you wouldn't be able to tell. Because it's at the convergence of technologies that you, you would be building these little, little, little devices. The pumps, the insulin pumps, they're not going to be any insulin pumps, they're going to be biological pumps within your body which are going to monitor and secrete insulin at the same time. So this nano-revolution is going to have magnificent artifacts as well as consequences for healthcare globally as well as in Pakistan. The second big revolution that is taking place is biotech. And biotech like nanotech is the science of atoms. Biotech is the science of cells. And just the way we are reconfiguring atoms, in exactly the same way we are reconfiguring cells. The DNA, the chromosome, the message, the expression, from genes to proteins, so proteins to expressions, so expressions to illness, illness to distress, distress to interventions, everything is up for grabs. And I always say this in the labs, if you look at labs, the rats are living twice as long with some interventions as they used to. The worms are living seven times as long. So I ask myself, Maybe I'm goose, I'm cooked. But what about my daughter? Why would she not live for 150 years? I mean, if my life is, average life is 70 years and rats are living in, la in the labs, rats are living for twice as long, 70 multiplied by two, if we are as good as rats, my friends, why would my daughter not live for 150 years? She's only 20, 21. She's ways to go. By the time is she's, 69, she's in her 60s, why would she not expect 150 years of life? And at what rate would this 150 become 1,000 with the progression of science? So I ask, just the way I cooked up these devices and I told you what is going to happen outside of you and inside of you, you wouldn't be able to tell what device it is, what science it is, in exactly the same way. Life and death is up for grabs. Globally it is. In Pakistan, big question mark. And I tell you why there's a big question mark in everything that I'm saying as we move forward. The third revolution that is brewing is connectivity, bits, bits and bytes. I mean, you remember those dial-in computer dial-ins? Do you remember those? That strange noise, Ding, 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 and, and then you're connecting and then it breaks down. Do you remember that? Compare that with the connectivity of this little thing. And this is passe, because my more sophisticated friends, they only wear a watch. They talk to the watch, I don't know what they're talking to, I don't know what they're computing, I have no idea what they're calculating. I don't know if it's going to be this or that computer that I have there. I, I, feel, I feel like a caveman. Because my children, they don't talk about the things that I talk about. They don't use the technology that I use. They don't even, they laugh at me when I basically leave them messages or write long messages. They, 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 they laugh. I mean, they say, no one writes like this. So I'm not even writing for my own children, set aside the future. I'm not using the technology the way they use technology. I'm not connected like them. So. All of this connectivity is creating a cloud, not the cloud that our friend in the morning spoke about, not that cloud, this ubiquitousness of information. And cloud is, as a technology, just one input into it. Space may be the other frontier. Who knows where this is going to sit, who's going to cook it, where it's going to get cooked. Suffice to say that information flow, information is something that you assume to be, is a commodity. So with the commoditization of information and connectivity, what is going to happen? That brings us to the next big revolution, which is the revolution of mind. Not revolution of mind in the way of thinking, in the way of, in the way of cognition, in the way of our understanding of neurons, in the way of our understanding of neural networks, in the way how brain is wired, what the bloody brain is all about, what is it? And that 
that understanding is lending itself to artificial intelligence because you have to understand intelligence before you understand artificial intelligence. So someone mentioned Elon Musk this morning and he has a company called Neuralink in which he is saying that all the brains in the world, the brains can be connected, we've already seen it for people with special needs, you know, they're Olympics for people with special needs. And you've seen people who are completely paraplegic, completely paralyzed. They have an exoskeleton and there's a football match and they get up. There are no buttons, there are no remote controls. They think and their exoskeleton is connected. You don't see any knobs getting into their heads. But the way the machine is connected with the mind, you think about getting up and you get up and you think about walking and you walk and your exoskeleton walks and you think about kicking the ball and you kick the ball. Now if all of this can happen, why can't this brain not be connected to the cloud as we defined this morning? And if all the people in the world, say seven, eight billion people, their brains were connected to the cloud, can you imagine the power of that cloud? Can you imagine the intelligence of that connectivity where all brains of the world are connected to a centralized cloud in which you have infinite memory, memory and you have infinite intelligence and you can tap into it and tap out of it and tap into it and tap out. Imagine a man with infinite memory. Imagine a man with the wisdom of all 8 billion people because if your mind is connected to your exoskeleton, then why can't your mind be tapped into a cloud and pulled up, in and out, in and out? That's where we're heading in the way of future. That's what future life is, can look like. I'm not saying will look like, but it can look like. So these are the four underpinnings, the nano revolution, the bio revolution, the information revolution, and the cognition revolution. And when you converge these four revolutions, you start to ask yourself if you're ready for this kind of life, this kind of healthcare or not. What are the specific implications of these long-term trends? Nothing that I've said so far, nothing, not a thing is without evidence. There's no fiction in this. All of the things that I've mentioned, the nanomaterials, the 3D printing, the uh, lens, the pumps, the longevity, the connectivity of mind with exoskeleton, the connectivity that you have right now, all of these things are real. Nothing that I've said is for the future. These things are commercialized things that are available right now. You mentioned, sir that for $100 right now in the United States, it took $1 billion, $1 billion in 13 years to map human gene sequence. Now it takes $100 and one day. Very soon it's going to be $10 and one minute. So imagine that world. That is the world for which you are gearing up. $10 and one minute, and your entire genome is mapped out. All of your pre-probabilistic predispositions are laid out in front. And in that you have to play whatever you're calling health or wellness or life. You have to play that life game in that, in that framework. So what is going to happen? Some fundamental questions are arising. People are beginning to ask if death is an illness. People are beginning to ask if that death will be an illness, if not right now. And I have no answers. We know that there's going to be death. But do you realize that cancer cells are immortal? Do you know what cancer is? Our cells are programmed. They're programmed to die. So in a certain life cycle, a natural biological trigger kicks in and it tells the cell, die, and the cell commits suicide. That's how the balance of the new cells that are created in the body and old worn out cells, that balance is maintained. One day, a cell mutates and forgets to die. Then that cell that has forgotten to die replicates and there are two cells which have forgotten to die. And then there are two to the power of two and then four to the power of four and then 16 to the, and all of a sudden you have a tumor. These are cells that are immortal. These are cells that have forgotten to die. So if you could decode, what about these cancer cells? 
What is the first mutation? And one of Pakistani scholars, Dr. Azra Raza, is working on this at Columbia University. A fantastic woman, fantastic. I'm inspired by her. Every time I go, I look her up. Completely inspired, floored by her intelligence. And she's asking a very simple question. What was the first mutation? What was the first thing that happened to the cell by virtue of which it forgot to die and became cancerous? And if you figure that out, what if you introduce that to human body? Is that the ticket to immortality? I mean, that's a question for which I don't have an answer, but I'm saying the science has begun to grapple and struggle with this idea. The, but well, how good would it be if you forget to die and continue to age and age and age and age and one day you can't even move but you wouldn't die? I mean, how tragic would that be? That would be cancer of another sort. But if you look at the 2012 Nobel Prize, which was given to Shania Yamaneka, it was about cell rejuvenation. It was not about living forever. It was about youth. It was about returning to youth. It was about posing to you a challenge as well as an option of growing old or young. With, with mutation of just four genes, they were able to rejuvenate the cells to youth. It's at the cellular level. But at this cellular level, as the science grows, what would youth look like? What would age look like? What would death look, look like? And what would be the meaning of life? These are the fundamental questions that surround the future of healthcare. We're already growing organs at the cellular level, at the scientific level. We're growing in little experiments. We're growing cells. I mean, the synthetic biology has already kicked in. I think it was the year 2000 when we produced the first virus, and it was 2010 when we produced the first bacteria. So we're already synthetically producing viruses and bacteria. So we are going to regrow. We already know about undifferentiated stem cell, a cell that doesn't know whether it's programmed to be a fingernail or a hair or heart. What if you start to, started to program those cells? And the technology CRISPR is available. You can clip the genes, you can mutate, you can add, you can delete. So you can play around with this new CRISPR te technology. You can now play around and design your genes. So what are you going to design yourself to be? These are some of the crazy questions. I mean, when you put these sciences, bring them together, these are the crazy questions that pop up. Um, am I taking too long? You have to check me. Five minutes? OK, good. So the cell therapy is in place. The gene therapy is in place. The underlying CRISPR technology is in place. The Nobel Prize has been given for the for rejuvenation of cell. When would this become cell, a rejuvenation of organ or regrowth of organ? When would that become the rejuvenation of life or youth or I, I don't know. The jury is out. But that's what the future is going to question. These are the questions that the future is going to grapple with. Um, and, and then therapy we've spoken about. I've already spoken with you about this, and this is already happening. But the labs that you go to, why do you need to go to these labs? Have you ever asked these questions? All of these chains of labs where you go. In scientific research, the lab is already, we have a DNA chip. The, the, the things that you were talking about in real time, these are actually protein and DNA chips are available, and those things are happening every day. Why do you need to go to a lab? Well, why do you even need to have this chip if I can put that lab in your body? If I can just plug it in, and it's continuously monitoring. I mean, the, the, the Apple Watch that you wear or Fitbit that you wear, it's already monitoring your vitals. If it can monitor your vitals with a little patch here, you can, you're already with that patch, you're monitoring your blood sugars. Why can't you monitor other things? So this lab on the chip and the lab, the patch on your back, combine these two, and you are going to do remote patient monitoring 24-7. So all of these uber-rich people in this room, and most of them are in this room, and definitely 90% of them in this city, they should know that they can be monitored 
And with a little bit of application of AI, with three or four or five vitals getting deranged coming together, with 99.9% .9 confidence interval, you can tell that this person is on for a heart attack or stroke and you can pick him up and save him. So all of these things are happening. The 3D printing is already taking place. Personalized medicine is already on the horizon. The watch you're already wearing, the patch for insulin or, or blood sugar is already there. The bi biological pump for insulin is already in the making. So what remains? These are things that have already happened. Some of the bigger questions that I've posed earlier about life and death and longevity and anti-aging and frailty and youth, those are up for grabs. But the rest of the stuff on this screen is already there. Robotics are there. If they can deliver their grocery, they can deliver your medication. And when they're delivering their medication, which has to be personalized, why medication? Why not the raw materials with 3D printing machine by your bedside for a chronic condition? Your, 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 your lab in your body, it titrates and figures out what is needed. Your 3D printing prints out the exact same proportions and that 50% effectiveness becomes 100% effectiveness because it's tailored to you. So the robot drops stuff in the machine, it flies in through your window, drops those raw materials on which we have just put 17% sales tax. With 17% sales tax, it drops them into this little printer. Your lab basically figures out how your blood sugars and blood pressures are faring out. The 3D printer basically gets this message and prints the exact specific drug which would work 100% of the time. So that's basically where we are heading with the future of healthcare. So what do we need to do? I think there are three stages in which we need to uh, move forward. First is clearly digitized care. I mean, this is like, if we, I mean, you really need to have a very low IQ not to do that, really low IQ. And therefore, that is obvious to me. The second is rationalized care, optimized care. And I think in order for you, us to do that, what we need is data. And we are going to be left out as probably the only country in the world which is not going to have that data. So the infrastructure of healthcare is information. And we don't have that. So it's always going to be my clinical judgment versus your clinical judgment. And if in that process of my judgment versus your judgment, if the care gets suboptimized, God's will. But that's not how the world is going. So if you want to optimize care, you'll need to have information. In order for you to have the information, you need to have infrastructure for information, which is digitization. So digitization or healthcare infrastructure, healthcare informatics is the infrastructure on which healthcare optimization is going to ride. You have to understand that healthcare is like a balloon. It's a closed balloon. You can't just decrease costs. You squeeze it here, it would pop up somewhere else like a balloon. And where it pops up would be the most expensive intervention. What you can save with prevention, if you don't do, you can save with a 10 cent medication. If you don't save it with 10 cent medication, you can save it through primary health care. If you don't save it at primary health care, you can save it at tertiary level. And if you don't do that, you're going to land up in an emergency situation, which is singularly the most expensive intervention. So you want to ha optimize health care, you'll have to digitize health care. You don't digitize health care, there's no freaking way on the face of this earth you're going to have an optimal health care system. And finally, you'll have to universalize it, you'll have to personalize it, and that those things I basically have already spoken about. I'm already committed to this. So, guys, I'm doing a startup doing exactly this. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, that was thought provoking and it had a lot of sci fi details. It actually literally transported us to a different time zone. Yes, I think that is the inevitable. Um, 
all the glorified dreams to be able to live forever, not to age, to have a healthy and happy life. If not for us, then perhaps for the generation to come. And you're very right to ask the questions. If we are not speaking the same language, are we at least keeping at par with the imagination of the coming generation, the Gen Z? Ladies and gentlemen, being adaptive and being open-minded is what is going to sail us through. But definitely, um, if we want to bring in the innovation and better governance in our healthcare system, System. Not only do we need to stay open, but we also need to invest in these ideas. Closing up this particular session, which was all about the future of healthcare, may I once again take this opportunity to invite uh, Air Chief Marshal Suhail Aman Saab and Rabia Ahmed from the Nutshell Group up on the stage. We'd like them to present the books to our worthy speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Managing Director of Farm Evo Private Limited and Shield Corporation, Mr. M. Harun Kassam. We'd be back to the future, Jetsons or even the good old Hogwarts. Dr. Musadek is absolutely right, all that we've imagined has manifested in one way or the other but please welcome him once again our worthy speaker who spoke about this very interesting topic of the future of healthcare the chairman of the standing committee on water resources senate of pakistan senator dr musaddiq malik Thank you, Musadik Saab. Thank you, Suhail Saab, and thank you, Rabia. With this, ladies and gentlemen, we come to a close of our seventh session. Thank you for being here.